Since our founding, the hours we work, the tasks we perform, the services we provide, and above all, the way we provide these services have all supported our singular mission, improving the quality of life of our people and those we serve. This is the most important differentiator of our company. It makes what we do unique. It is a source of pride and inspiration for all of us who work at Sodexo. Today, we take a step further towards our goal of improving quality of life by unifying the way we envision it and how we embed it into every aspect of our work. Following extensive research, we identified six dimensions known to affect quality of life on which our services have a direct impact. Ease and efficiency. Imagine a world where everything runs smoothly, whether dropping the kids off in the morning or heading to a meeting. Sodexo services open the doors to a world where you can devote your full attention to the task at hand, rather than being distracted by logistics. A world where you can maintain a work-life balance. Health and well-being. A truly healthy lifestyle requires an holistic approach. Maintaining overall physical well-being involves adopting healthy eating habits, having access to well-balanced meals, and maintaining regular physical activity. Recognition. Is recognition a powerful source of motivation? Yes. Being recognized for a job well done is a vital component of quality of life, allowing individuals to select their own rewards based on their interests ensures that they feel genuinely appreciated. Physical environment. Did you know that the design of a space has a critical impact on our perception of personal safety and comfort? From optimal lighting to a reliable source of clean air to a safe building structure, purposefully designed and well-maintained environments bolster quality of life wherever you are. Social interaction. A friendly conversation over a cup of coffee. A lunchtime break with classmates. An afternoon companion for the elderly. Creating an atmosphere that is conducive to social interaction can produce very productive outcomes for individuals. Personal growth. Improving one's quality of life can start with taking a class, learning a new skill, or mastering an area of expertise. Whether developing a current path or changing directions altogether, building upon one skill set creates the opportunity to achieve personal goals. These dimensions constitute our common definition of quality of life. We improve quality of life by having a positive impact on one, several, or all of these dimensions through the services we deliver. These dimensions are at the heart of the experience we provide to the individuals we serve day in and day out. Okay, everybody, we're coming down to the end today. <laughs> this is the last concurrent session, so you are in session C4, Living Our Aspirations, Promote Resident Empowerment, Resident-Led Initiatives to Bridge the Gap Between Generations. So my name is Mel. If you need anything, I'm up front. Um, I ask you all to turn your cell phones to off or vibrate, please. You know the drill by now. Um, at the end, I'll give you this CEU code. Um, and don't forget um, to use the app. And you can do your online evaluation form there. You'll be entered in a drawing um, for next year's conference for free registration. So don't forget to use that. And I'll turn it over to our guides. We have David Kent. We have Dennis Zafarovsky. Did pretty good, didn't I? And Sammy Kermani. Okay. Very good. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. Hi, everyone. You're at the right session, by the way. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for the last session of the day. It is a, a great pleasure for us and, and a high honor to, uh, to be here today and 
take part of this uh, milestone 20th anniversary of the Pioneer Network Conference on changing the culture of aging, uh, appropriately titled Be the Future. We're very excited to be here and share our experiences, uh, learn from yours, and um, we're looking forward to the next 20 years. So uh, my name is Dennis Zafirovsky, and I'm the director of nursing at the village of Erin Meadows, which is located in uh, beautiful Mississauga, Ontario. And yes, it's the, the same Mississauga that former President Barack Obama could not pronounce, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I've been fortunate enough to be working with Schlegel Villages, um, serving seniors for over 10 years now. And um, I'm very proud to be a part of uh, this organization, which is a relatively small family-owned organization, but it's based on family values. And um, we're known for excellent dementia care and for being the leaders in culture change and promoting a social model of living. I'm joined today by Sammy Kermani. She's our director of recreation uh, at the village, and she's one of the original team members of uh, Erin Meadows. Um, which is about 15 years now. And uh, for the last 12, she's been the director of the, of the recreation department. And uh, obviously, we're also joined by our superstar resident, Mr. <laughs> David Kent. I'm sure you've met him already. Um, David is uh, the president of the resident council at the, at the village. He's the co-chair of the village advisory team. As you heard today, Vice President of the Ontario Association of Resident Councils. He's a former teacher of history and physical education, but more importantly, still an educator in our home of the residents, the family members, and team members in various subjects. And he's got so many titles, but one I want to highlight is that he's one of the recipients of the um, Lifetime Achievement Award, which is awarded to residents uh, living in long-term care homes for significant co contributions to the quality of life of, of residents, uh, which is presented by the Ontario Long-Term Care Association. So congratulations to you, David. Who is this guy? <laughs> so uh, today we're here to talk to you about um, the several intergenerational initiatives uh, or programs that have taken place in our village to bridge the gap uh, between generations. And these are the three amigos. I'm the one in the middle there. <laughs> so what's the agenda? We'll tell you uh, why we're here today. How did we get started on this journey? Um, we'll touch a little bit on resident empowerment and what that means to us and our residents. We'll, uh, Sammy will review the, the different intergenerational programs that have taken place in, in the village over the years. David will personally tell you about his story and how he became a, a facilitator and more, more involved in all these programs. We also have a recommendation or a new initiative that, that we'll um, suggest to you if you wish to, to implement in your own homes. And then we'll open it up for questions at the end. So one of the, one of the latest uh, resident-led initiatives um, basically was a collaboration between our village and the local high school um, where residents from our community were engaged in the development and the delivery of a health and wellness course. And um, I, you know, I, I have a handout and I can forward it to, to anyone uh, you know, that summarizes basically what is this all about? You know, why is it so important? How to get started if you wish to, to, you know, to try something like this? Who is all involved, the resources used, and so on? I think David, David will touch on it, you know, a, a bit later. But um, it's basically one of the, the, the latest uh, initiatives that, you know, we implemented at the village, and it was very successful. Um, but more importantly, I wanted to just, you know, uh, briefly discuss how we got started. So Schlegel Villages, which is, uh, as I mentioned, um, a small organization out of uh, Kitchener, Ontario, made a decision to join the, the, the journey of changing the culture of aging back in 2009. And uh, the following year, in, in the fall of 2010, is when we 
collectively develop uh, aspirational statements. These aspirational statements or aspirations are basically the key principles, the pillars of the overarching goal uh, of this journey uh, of changing the culture of aging and, and putting living first. That's, that's what we call it. And those are the eight aspirational statements. It's you know, promoting resident empowerment, promoting cross-functional teams, fostering authentic relationships, offering flexible living, offering flexible dining, creating opportunities for meaningful and shared activities, honoring diversity in village life, and finally, the connecting research and innovation to village life. So promoting resident empowerment is one of the, the very important ones. I mean, they're all important, but you know, our initiative is mostly aligned with, uh, with uh, the promoting resident empowerment. And so what is resident empowerment? So our villages understand that empowerment or resident empowerment is a fundamental human right. Our empowered residents are supported by our team members and their families in finding and fulfilling their life purpose. We see the residents as the leaders. So this is an example of an empowered resident who went on, went on a hot air balloon ride, you know, as that, that, that was their wish. So we made that happen for them. So I'll turn it over to Sammy to review the, the different intergener uh, intergenerational programs that have taken place over the years. And then uh, David will discuss the, the last two that he was involved with. Thank you, Dennis. Hello, everyone. So the first, um, the first intergenerational pro project that we had with this school was, we called it Wisdom Project, which is different from elder, Wisdom of the Elder that we presented yesterday. In 2009, we had this program with Stephen Lewis Secondary School with the goal to encourage compassion, respect, and understanding between generations and across ethnic and religious lines so students and her elderly alike can recognize their common humanity. We had um, 12 students coming for six weeks to our village, and we paired them up with six residents, each resident with two students. For six weeks, once a week, they met, they had uh, uh, their social time, their, and then at the end of the six weeks, in week seven, students presented our residents to us and what they gained. And they showed, showed us you know, their, our residents in so many creative ways, you know, by poems, by painting, video clips. Then in 2014, we had a very similar project with uh, the, same, this, the same school, which uh, we called it Sharing Smiles. This time, the goal was to develop interaction amongst teens and the elderly and promote a compassionate, respectful society. Very similar, very successful. And both of these projects, if they were that successful, which uh, they were featured at that time in local newspapers and in Ontario Long-Term Care magazine. Then, Mr. David Kent came to our village to live there on August 6, 2014. And in 2015, when we began a new project with John Fraser School, uh, uh, YSI project that we call it Young Social Inventors, with the goal to raise awareness and destigmatize perception youth often have about the elderly, actively eradicate ageism and begin to bring change for the future generations. That was our goal. Mr. Kent was one of, our, one of the six residents, which we paired him with two students. And then we noticed that how much potential and strength is in that gentleman so that 36, seven years teaching and leading and facilitating um, youth and connecting with them, we can't let it be wasted. 
So when we had, when we started another project, band project, which was Bridge Ageism Now, with the same school, with the goal to develop positive relationship with, with two generations and engage a student actively in long-term care, day-to-day -day life. I talked to David and said, you know what, David, uh, we're gonna start a new project, but I don't think this time it should be one of the six residents that we choose. And he said, that's fine, Sammy, it's fine with me. No, I understand for sure, I can't be always the one. I said, no, I really think you have to be the lead and facilitator for this project. So what David did was interviewing to all the students, choosing the residents that they're gonna be involved in that project, find, uh, pairing students with the students, um, having, planning a three-hour three presentation and orientation to the students and the teachers, you know, to know almost everything about their um, life in long-term care, and uh, planning that each week what they're gonna do, and it, it was that great success, which then we received a phone call from the school inviting David and me to the school for a new proposal. And I have to say, they just wanted to be nice to me to invite me. It was all about David. <laughs> so I want David to tell, to tell you about the proposal and the rest of the story. Thank you, Sammy. You're welcome. Okay, before we get to the proposal, I would like to just give you a quick uh, uh, episode, really, I guess you'd call it in a way, that when I, I two years ago, I, I came here and I came to give a talk, seeing new life through the lens of well-being, one man's journey on long-term care. That was, that was the topic. And I stayed at a sunrise uh, rest retirement home close to here. And so when we arrived, we were late. And they had everybody in that ballroom, huge number of people there. And so when we arrived, you see Rahila is one of my, the caregiver that's with me today. She was the bus driver. So here's the scene. We're late. There's one of the, the buses from, uh, the shuttle bus is there from O'Hare, from, from the hotel. And there's four or five guys outside. A concierge is getting a smoke. And a couple other people are just out there getting some fresh air. They see this bus arrive. And they looked over. And I'm inside the bus. I could see what's going on. They looked over and thought, what is this as a ride? And out of the bus comes a bus, comes a driver. Rahila dressed in her culture outfit. She walks around. And out of the other side, passenger side, comes the, the, uh, our manager at that time, Annalise, about 5 foot 11, all dressed up nice and carrying a laptop. She comes out. So there's the two. They go to the ramp. They drop the ramp. These guys are really interested now. Who's in, who's in the bus? They drop the ramp. And the third person is in the bus with me because I'm all hooked down in there. And I'm wearing my dark glasses. And so the ramp drops. And out comes a white Ray Charles. They were blown away. I tell you, these guys couldn't believe it. And so down goes the ramp. Rahila goes around, and no one says anything here. Goes around, gets the bus. She drives off, and the third person comes out, looking one of the, like one of these chirples. They're carrying all the video camera, all my stuff. She's all bent over. I say nothing. One door is open. The second door is open, and the king comes through. There we are. So that was the episode. And uh, we've had a lot of laughs out of that one. Okay, so I arrived August the, si August the 6th, 2014, at the uh, village of Aaron Meadows. And that is what you see. That's a passport picture of 2012, not even 2014. And I pulled out this passport picture a couple months ago and, and said, who is this guy? Because... I was a wreck 
coming into this home. Absolute mess. I had the disease called inclusion body myositis. It's incurable. Uh, I was the first one in Canada to get this disease. Six or seven out of a million get it. They thought it was Lou Gehrig. Then they thought it was MS. Then they thought it was MD. They didn't know what it was. So for eight years, they tried to figure out what it was. And uh, anyway, uh, it's called inclusion body myositis. And this muscle disease is a wasting disease. And when I came in, I weighed 133 pounds. Now there I am, 26 pounds heavier. This is passport I got 2017, in, in uh, about two months ago. Uh, my disease is in full remission, and I gain muscle back, which is supposed to be impossible. It does not happen with this. The doctors are blown away, they can't figure it out. Uh, I have a neuroscientist uh, nephew that told me, he says, I think that something, it's internal. I think it's, I think it's inside you, what's what's happened. And so here's the next slide. How did this happen? And I thought about this for a long time. Uh, it's a miracle, certainly to me and, 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 and others. And uh, I read three books to help explain this. And it's positive thinking over medicine. It's you are the placebo is the second one. And the third one is a new biology of belief. And in, that, in those three books, it all talks about the happy, happy hormones. It talks about positivity. It talks about being uh, at peace with yourself. And that was what happened to me after I was in this home. For three weeks, I thought, as I said in the plenary, I thought I was in prison. I, I just couldn't see any positive thing at all. Uh, I did not feel good. And I didn't know what was going to happen. I said to my wife, I said, this is it. I, I, I can't see how I can handle this. The positive outlook happened for me when I thought about two people. I thought about my, my dad, and I thought about my father-in-law. And my father-in-law was a, a World War II vet, very bright guy. His wife died. And when he went into his nursing home, he packed it in. He just gave up. He never left the room at all. He died a year and a half later. My dad was, was uh, moved. He was in his, his retirement home with mom. She was still alive. And the difference here is that dad found something to do. At that time, they didn't have things in these institutions to do. And so mom played the piano for everybody. Mom played cards with people and made sure she lost to keep up the other person's confidence. And dad dressed up in his suit, bow tie, and would go and work the elevators. He was the elevator guy. And he talked with them there. He'd get to know them there. And when dad passed away, where was that nice man who worked here? They didn't know he was, he was a resident. They thought he was staff. So I chose dad. That was the one that was my role model. Alternative medicine, natural health practitioner. I have a wonderful person in Mississauga. She's one of the best in the country, 25 years in natural health. Uh, I taught 25 years with this disease, and it got me through with alternative medicine. There were teas from the Brazilian rainforest I was told about. That's what I took, and it leveled off my problem, and my uh, uh, doctors and neurologists didn't thought her machine was broken when she tested me because it went from high spikes in, in an inflammation to no spikes in the inflammation. I didn't tell her what I was doing. I waited another six months. Same thing. I don't get what it is. I said, I, said, I think I can tell you what it is. It was the tea I was taking. It slowed everything down for me to carry on with what I was doing. So that's the National Health Practitioner. And the, the big thing is the environment of Schlegel villages and there in the mills. The PSWs, of which Rahila is one, were unbelievable. The nurses were fantastic. 
And I started to feel better. And after three weeks, my intestinal system was improved to the point where it was better than it was in five years. That's in three weeks. In five years, it was better. So something magical was taking place. And it's the happy hormone thing again. I felt better. I felt like I wanted to do something now. And so when the opportunity came, thanks to Sammy and group, to come and, and teach, as our, there's our main street where all kinds of things take place. OK, the next one there. There's the teaching crowd. And I have the cheerleader is the volunteer on the left. She's a dental hygienist. I've got Larissa on the, on the right. She's my co-teacher. And she taught in, in drama in the Ukraine. And uh, there I am in, in the middle there. And this team, and we really click. It'll be three years, September the 21st, that, that, that we will have our, our th three year um, celebration. I, it's 70 there, but it, it's up to 75 now since, since I made this thing. I, I've done five. I did one just Monday. We're doing a series on the CBC of the story of us about Canada's 150th birthday. So it's a great series. I introduce it for 15 minutes. Remember, it can't be more than that, or they start sleeping on you. And then on goes, on goes the video. So that's that. Here's the class. And I don't know if you know any Al Alfred Hitchcock's movie, but any Alfred Hitchcock movie, he always is in that movie. Look who's at the back of the class. It's the teacher <laughs> hiding there. So here's the, here's the, the gang. And uh, the 100 year old lady didn't make this for this one. But it's quite a variety of, of, uh, of people. And we've got uh, some that can't, that can't talk. I've got some, I've had blind people there. Uh, we've got some that are deaf, but they come to see the video. And we have, uh, uh, I've got, who else is in there? We've got three 97s. And we got another person tur has turned to 100 just uh, last week. And no testing. They all pass. <laughs> and they're just a, they're a, they're a fantastic group. And the, the first one I ever did, first class I did, was the uh, group of seven painters. I think, I think I've told some folks this. And they're the, they're the soul of, of Canada because they, they portray our, our wonderful natural beauty in the country. And uh, after this was done I, with the paintings, uh, I asked Larissa, I said, How'd you, how did it go? That's my first lesson in 20 years, my first lesson. And she said, David, nobody fell asleep. That's the benchmark. That's the benchmark. So there, there, it's a wonderful thing. And, and it, that purpose got me back on track. Here's the band project. Here's two of the, of the young ladies I had before this picture. This is 2016. 2015, here are the two young, young people I had here. We have uh, Rafi on the left and Rabia on the right. And Raf, uh, Rafi on the left, when I read her bio, because they have to, you have to be, I have to pair them up. With, and actually, Sammy paired these two up with me. And Rafi had no self-esteem whatsoever, no self-confidence, didn't know what to do. And uh, it was great to, to, to get her. And we clicked right away with those, with those two. And we, uh, uh, she started to, to come out of her shell, which was, which was pretty nice to see. Rabia is the outgoing. She's the extrovert. And here's the things that happen with, with these two. Rafia, for the second group came, she ran the group. She was the one in charge of the group. Look what happened to her in one year. Unbelievable. And Rabia who is going to be a, uh, she is going to be a doctor, but she's going to be a doctor working with older folks because she's exposed to this. Both are volunteers at the home. And Ravia, I saw her last summer, has come back from the university, and she's now one of the volunteers at the home. That's the connection we had with resident, with the kids. And it worked because you're bonded for, for uh, six sessions here. 
you got time to see. They saw your room, they saw what, they heard your careers, and uh, the other five residents that were along with me two, two years ago all clicked with, with, their, with their people. There were no failures here. It worked for everybody. And some of the folks that had came from, from there were three came from areas that are not cognitive. They came from less cognitive ones. And the one lady, one of the, the uh, behavioral uh, team members came to, came to tell me, her name is Susan, and she has dementia. And Susan couldn't wait for that young person to come. And she said, when, when they left, she's almost in tears for this connection. The celebration, which I'll, I'll show you later, was, was something we'll, we'll see. Now, Project 2, which we started, last year, same high school. It's, it's got one of the best high schools in Mississauga, maybe Ontario, it's unbelievable, this high school. It's called a specialist high school major. This is what they have in Ontario now. You don't get credit points with this. You get a seal of accomplishment with this. And all the kids in, in Ontario have to have 40 years, 40 years, 40 hours of, of a community work in order to get the diploma. And so grade 11 and 12 students, you see, they focus, the diploma is OSSD, it's called. And they took the health and wellness sector. That's what their, that was their expertise is. You have to apply to the Ministry of Education to get your particular discipline. There's 19 different disciplines, forestry, business, um, health and wellness, hospitality, all kinds of different things that the kids will choose. And it's a chance for them to experiment, to focus on something that they may do or may not do. It depends. It's like a screening thing. And in the case of these folks, they had to complete a bundle of eight to 10 courses in that subject. CPR, first aid, which is certification, good regardless of what you do and a co-op portion of this. And the co-op portion, uh, they would go to, to areas like hospitals. So one came to our home. And you get two credit points for this because you're at the place for two months. And the, uh, the schedule for this, uh, plus they're senior students. They're grade 11 and 12 students. And the course is two years. We had 30 students come from the school that uh, 26 girls, four guys, that's about the ratio, mm -hmm. right? You think about the homes. I mean, if you see a male, oh my God, there he is, a, a, like an endangered species in the, over in the corner. <laughs> so the, the 30 students, we did an orientation session with the, with the, at the beginning, and uh, I wanted to make sure they saw the different facets of, of the home, so I had, we had, uh, uh, an expert on, on dementia, spent a half an hour telling them what to look for, what to, how, how they would react, etc. A PSW spoke to them. A nurse spoke to them. And a volunteer spoke to them. And the volunteer spent about an, uh, almost an hour going through all the different things that Schlegel, this Schlegel Village Aaron Meadows has. We have 200 volunteers at the Village of Aaron Meadows of which 40% are high school students. So it's a, it's a tremendous blend of, of people. And uh, how, this is what we did, there's 30. We broke them up into groups of seven students. They came once a week for two hours, and we tried to put them in different areas, different neighborhoods, to get a feel and a blend of what our place is about. And at the end, there was a celebration just like there was for the band project of about an hour and a half. Okay, there's the start of the orientation session. There's Sammy, I just wanna go back for a minute. There's uh, Sammy and myself, and uh, we asked the students, what was the first thing, what was the biggest surprise coming into to this home? To a person, they said, we thought for sure it'd be an institution. We thought they'd be in their rooms, we couldn't believe the number of their acts were out of the rooms, moving around, doing things, and looking happy. What is this place? 
So that was, the, that was their first real surprise. And what an opportunity to, tell, to show these kids that we, we are alive and that I don't care what you've got. You, you have feelings and you know what's going on. And age isn't a factor here. Age is just something you say because look at the class I had with, the, with the, these, a 97-year-old coming in there and pulling herself along the railing to get the class. Even though she's late, I let her in to get the class. <laughs> so that was, that was the orientation. And here's what something was really funny. Because there was the seven students we had for this particular session, there was a maternity party going on in, par in the lounge. And so they saw the maternity party. And then I looked over. They, they disappeared. On. I looked over, and there's, we have a long hallway you saw there, Main Street. I looked over and saw the teacher that was with them videotaping. She could hardly hold the camera. She was laughing so hard. What did she see? A Congo line, birthday bash, led by the two guys. They never danced before. That's what she told me. They don't have dances with 85-year-old women behind them. <laughs> These are the things, the birthday bash. And we had them with the chime class. We had them uh, with the singing, the vocal group. They went to the secure area down at the bottom where there was a sing-along. And so they were sitting beside a couple of folks. And uh, they, they made the students sing. You're not going to sit or not sing. Are you kidding? And so they had to sing. How successful was the schism? It was a tremendous success. And uh, the students were so inspired. It was funny when Sammy and I first, they first came in, you could hear a pin drop. They, they didn't know what they were coming to. And they thought, oh my, now we're behind these closed doors. And none of them had been a volunteer, so it was all a fresh group. And so we asked one of the teachers, because they're very quiet, we asked it one of the two teachers, they said, is this, is this class that quiet all the time? Are you kidding me? They got out of the class, and yak, 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 all the way back. They couldn't say enough of what, the, what they had seen. So they were, they were hooked within that first, that first session. And at the end of the, of the four other, other sessions where they came for, for the uh, uh, two hours, there was a party. And the party was, uh, as Sammy knows, the band party, it's like a love-in. It's unbelievable. They had, they had videos. They had uh, role model things done where one pretended to be the, uh, an interviewer and the other person pretended to be a resident. I mean, the stuff they came up with. There were poems. There was, uh, uh, what else did they have? I can't think of all there was just, but they, they, they were so inventive. Oh, they had poster, a poster series. And, the, and they didn't do this with us individually, but with the band, what they did was they gave the residents gifts. And one resident is from Iran, and her English is, is very poor. At this school, they had somebody who speaks Farsi, which is Iranian. So there are two students that sp spoke Farsi that hooked up with this, with this lady. And they gave her a Persian jewel box. She broke down and cried. And his, I know the parent, I know that not the parents, but I know the, the son and, and daughter. That is her prized possession that she has in her room. And every time she opens that up, she thinks of those two wonderful kids. And they come back and visit. It's not a one-shot deal and they're gone. They come back and visit. The two girls came back to visit me, is that, that picture I showed you, for the celebration. So it's, it's, a, it's not a one-time thing. It's, it's a lasting thing. That's some of the comments that they, did, they made for us. Uh, the thank you notes, thank you for the year of hard work, dear Sammy, David, et cetera, et cetera. Appreciate every single one had comments that you'd want to keep and store for a lifetime. OK, Meet the Elders Program. Meet the Elders Program is our offshoot from, from the elder of the, wisdom of the elder. And I wanted to do, do, do something that 
Uh, we involve the, the uh, students in a different way. And the different way was we would bring two storytellers with them. And so uh, we try with two high schools. And, two, and, and it's an interesting thing. It was an experience for, for us. I thought it would be automatic. We, we negotiate with a high school, and they want to come and, and join in right away. Wrong. Because some of the folks out there, it's, it's not a given that they would come to a long-term care home. I just assumed that. And so we had the first two schools. We didn't get a, a positive response from the one, because she's a new principal. And the second one, they wanted to do it, but they wanted to do it on their terms, with making a, really a big deal of it, of it. We wanted to keep it simple. We didn't want a big deal with this. And so we might include them uh, in the fall. We went back, to, Sammy went back to the, the favorite school, John Fraser Secondary School, for these wonderful people. And they set it up for us. And so we arrived, at, they, they made an announcement, they sold tickets, for, and, they, and they arranged for the students to have pizza when they were there. And so when we, when we arrived, they had everything all set up for us. And we had the four of us came in. Just, 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 just a second. Yeah, the four of us came in. There we are. And uh, you can see Mohammed is sitting on a wisdom of the elder bench out there. Because he was one of the gentlemen last year went to one of our, our uh, uh, plazas and sat on that bench Jan, uh, June the 6th. All the Schlegel homes have a, a wisdom of the elder day. You go to communities, you go here, you go there. He went to, to the square, and people came and sat down with him to talk with him. That was the idea of this thing. So we bought the bench with him because he wanted to have a bench to sit on. So he made sure it was a wise bench. So he sat on the wise bench. Beside him is Marie, and she is 100 years old. And just a bit about these the two. How's the time? OK, 10 minutes. That's, not, that's pretty good. We sit beside each other there. So I chose Muhammad because Muhammad is a Muslim. Muhammad is 92. Mahazna, he was a businessman. I chose Marie. She's a Christian. And Marie lives in a small place called Brixit on Georgian Bay. So what a better way to bring the Christian and the Muslim into an environment like this. We're going to expose the kids to, the, to this environment. And they're going to see, guess what? If you've got love and care in a home, you don't care what religion you are. You're all equal. That's exactly what they were, equal as they should be. And so the next one. So here's the four questions that I posed to them. How did you survive the Depression of 1930? They both went through the Depression. Marie was, was uh, 15. Mohammed was five, 10 years different. And they both survived the Depression. Marie uh, is the, was the youngest of 14 kids. And Mohammed, uh, at the age of five, Dad lost his job. They moved him to, to his aunt. He stayed with his aunt for 10 years. They both survived because they had strong parents. And that time of the Depression, there just wasn't the work. And they're all over the place to try and find work. So the women had to do a lot of the things. And both of these people, you'll see what obstacles in a minute, both of these people overcame obstacles that you would wonder, how did they ever do it? So number two question, what obstacles did you overcome in your life? And let's take Marie first. Youngest of 14, she went to a three-room schoolhouse. Grade eight is the, is the greatest amount of education she got because the father was off doing things. And there, it turned out that the, the uh, second oldest of her, of, of her uh, brother, second oldest brother. Five kids, uh, and the mother died. He had to go to work. Who's left? 
Marie and her mother are left. And so they took in the five. And then, wouldn't you know it, after three years, the mother dies. So Marie brought up her niece and nephews starting at the age of 15. And she held them, she had them there until it was 28 years old was, it was when the oldest left. The kids, could, the kids were awestruck with this. They can't, they can't even, who, who can picture this? And the beautiful part of this is, at her 100 year celebration, the second youngest of those five came back to celebrate the 100 year with, a celebration with her. The only one left, he's 86. An 86 year old <laughs> comes back for the 100 year old surrogate mother. Unbelievable stuff. And in, in Muhammad's case, his obstacles with him, he lost both brothers one day. They ate something that, 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 uh, that uh, was, was poisonous, toxic. He lost both brothers. He went through, in his life, he was born in India, Calcutta. He went to the University of Calcutta. Very bright guy. Business and commerce. They were involved in World War II bombing of Calcutta. They moved to Bangladesh. Next thing you know, they're involved with, with a war between India and Pakistan and Bangladesh. And in that, in that war, his home was destroyed. They, took, they blew everything out of the home. They were fugitives. All the kids, there were three kids and the two of them. The uncle came through with them, and the uncle arranged for them to escape, basically, to Iran. And in Iran, he had a, uh, another relative in Iran that found work for him, and he worked in Iran for, I guess, 15 years, something like that, until the Shah of Iran, a revolution. Now he's in another revolution. Then, if that wasn't enough, the Iraq War. And he was telling that he was, they were, he bombed their place 500 yards away from his place it was bombed. He had sent his, 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 his wife and kids to Karachi in Pakistan. He would see them about every twice, twice um, a year for a, couple, for a couple of months each time. That's it. And after, the, after the, the, to this particular uh, ordeal he went through, he finally said, I had enough. I'm moving. He had a relative in Canada, and that's, where, that's when he moved to Canada. But that's what these two went through. What was the happiest time of, the, of your life? This got quite the reaction from the kids. For a Muhammad, my wedding day. And the kids didn't know what to do with this one. They were kind of snickering. They felt a little awkward. To have somebody 92 basically say, to them, you know what? I fell in some, with love with somebody X many years ago. They looked around like this at each other. Whoa, this is, this is really cool. And with Marie, she said, bringing up a family. That was the happiest time of her life. You would think that would be the worst time of your life, trying to look after all these different things. It was the happiest time of her life. What words of advice do you give the kids? And Muhammad's was, enjoy every day. It could be your last. Look what that gentleman went through. Of course he would say that. And with Marie, she said, respect your parents because they're the best friends you're ever going to have. Next one. There's, the, there's all the group at, at, the, at the end. And uh, it was a wonderful, a, wonderful, a wonderful day. You see the table there? They had the table set up with flowers. It's a high school. And they had three teachers that are very passionate about what they do. And phenomenal teachers. And one of the teachers teaches the, the, is the band project one. And so they had, at the end, they had pieces, I say, and they had water. And then they had uh, four students come up with, with a plant of a, a, a flower. And each one gave, Sandy got one, I got one, and the two storytellers each got one. And then they handed us a card, a thank you card, a, how inspiring we were. It was a class act from, from these people. And the big plus out of this, they had two photographers here. They photographed this, 
they put it in their newsletter for 1,400 students to see the story and see the pictures. What a connection. And those 1,400 would go home. How many would they tell? Another 2,000, whatever. So that's the kind of, of building projects. That's my mission. It can be done by anybody. Any home can do this. Just hook up with your local high school. And I, it's, it's magic. And here's the recommendations. Be the future. That's the theme. This is the future right here. This is the future with your local high schools to help destigmatize de 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 the perception that students have about your homes and the person living there by making them aware of the wisdom of your elders. You all have elders. Everyone, and the stories they have, you can fill libraries across the states with this thing. Some students might pursue their careers in healthcare or long-term care. If they do, that's great. But there's gonna be nurses, kinesiologists, occupational therapists, personal support workers are going to uh, find this the occupation that they would like to pursue. Some might volunteer, but here's the key. All the students will see the examples of love, care, and the wisdom of us, the residents. Thank you very much. And there's, the, there's the cake they gave us. <laughs> I was curious how, how the questions and the sort of like the curriculum were chosen, the, the topics and... In, in, in which, no. I mean, I mean is it the schism? Part... Yes, were, were you talking about the... the well, I... That we initially talked about? Yes, the, the earlier, the yeah. earlier ones, so yeah. The, that was the, the health and wellness program. This one on or no? yeah. So for the health and wellness program, so basically um, the students visiting the school, that was part of the outreach program. Okay. So it's really giving the students exposure to long-term care okay. for a certain amount of hours. So what we did was we did two to three hours of orientation where we welcomed them, we reviewed the different disciplines, they heard from the direct care team members, they heard about dementia and our philosophy in the, you know, for dementia yeah. care. We did the tour, I think David did the tour to all the neighborhoods. It's called the exponential part of this, as, as I kind of said, the outreach, yeah. where they, they, they get a feel of this. Yeah. They're getting credit and stuff yeah. for this. It's kind of an extra thing they do to see if they want to pursue this. So it's flexible in terms of what, you know, what we want to, how do we want to involve them? Because it's a limited amount of, of time. Uh -huh. And uh, we, we decided to you know, spread it you know, in six weeks where they would visit weekly, be paired up with different you know, direct care team members and get that exposure. Right. No problem. Another question? Yes. <laughs> so what advice would you give to a home that was thinking of a, setting up such a program? You mentioned, I think at one point, there was one high school that was going to make too big a deal of the, yeah, the right. program. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give a home that wished to set up such a program? Well, I, the advice to me was don't give up because uh, you, you all have a lot of local schools. We have uh, five around us. So the first two didn't work, which really surprised me. Uh, one said they will do it, but kind of on their terms later. That's all right. We'll, we'll go back to them. And uh, we went for a third one. And then uh, next year, we're going to go back to the, to the original one again. We sent out invitations from the, uh, from, the, from the president of the resident council. We sent an invitation to the school to see if they wanted to come to negotiate with us and work out, work out a plan where, whereby we would go there and exchange whatever. And so um, that, uh, that didn't work. It didn't mean it didn't work again, and we'll use it again. And so we decided that we were going to approach the school. And we knew John Fraser had done some great work for us. So Sammy had, had gone to a, a, a dementia workshop there, saw the principal, who's pragmatic. The principal's the key. The principal is the key of these places. Because the first school, the principal was brand new, and she was overwhelmed. The second school, apparently, she's not big on the community connections. So good luck with that principal. And the third principal, 
is very pragmatic. She wants to do these things. She, oh, she has an open mind. Remember, we're not just trying to sell the, sell the, uh, the uh, students. We're trying to sell the principals. And we're finding that out with the OERC. We're trying to sell the ministry. Like the, the, like the Pioneer Network and, and what we do with Schlegel, we're way ahead of the curve. We're up here and the governments are back here. Trying, trying, it's not, not true, trying to get the, the, the connection. So we're getting, we're, we, we pop in there and try and be the catalyst to try and get this thing moving. So um, I know in Ottawa, you've got all kinds of, of great schools in Ottawa. And uh, for St. Pat's, your school, what a natural. I mean, they would just love that. And uh, you've seen some examples of, of what we've tried that worked. And I think, it's, I think the sky's the limit. I really do for uh, North America. I see this as, as we've got 638 uh, homes. Look at the number of schools around those homes. Now the schism for our place, all the schisms, you, all the schools don't get that particular health and wellness schism. But they have other ones that, that might be of interest. But I've, I found out just before I came here, the schisms have been so successful they want more high schools to have those schism possibilities, which means more health and wellness courses for more high schools. So this is the cusp of something I, I envision as being really a big deal because uh, they're the future. And we get them feeling the way those kids felt, and they come back as volunteers. They tell the network with their buddies. And before you know it, the destigmatizing is not destigmatizing anymore. It's gone. Uh, so thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, going back to your early days at the villages, I mean, we often see elders who come into our homes uh, experiencing the things that you were experiencing. A lot of what you did was pull yourself out of it. Is there any advice you have for us as care partners of what we can do to help get people to where you've gotten? Well, uh, could anything have been done externally, or did it all have to come from your own? Well, well I think finding, finding out what, what uh, and I think this has been mentioned before, finding out what they did before. You know, that's, that's crucial. And then uh, don't push them, because uh, I've been able to uh, be the mentor for uh, three others coming into the neighborhood, because I've, I've gone through this. And the three others, I didn't push any of them. Uh, actually, there were, there were four. One, one was unsuccessful because he just doesn't want to be there, period. But I've tried for a year with him. You approach it slowly. You tell them what you went through. They, it was, see, you're coming in cold like I came in. This is all new to you. You've left your loved one or the loved one has died, and you're going to a bunch of strangers, and, uh, in the, and you're seeing all these folks that are worse off than you are. It's scary. And so the to get somebody to, to come and talk to you that went through this is just, I can't say enough about that. Well, I know you feel like this, I felt like this. You're gonna feel like that for three weeks or a month. That's what I mean, don't push it. In the case of Mohammed, three days later, he was out doing activities. He just, you know, he just, because he knows, he went, look at his life. He, he cherishes every day, this guy. And so when we have a lockdown at the home because of the, of a, every home goes through this because of flu, they close everything up. Now you are in prison, there's no question about that. So you should see the number of folks at that door. What do I do? Where do I go? Why is this happening? And that, I guess, used to be the, the institution of, of before. They didn't, that was it. They, they didn't have anything else. So they are so in tune with, with of getting out and just seeing and, and doing different things that when it's closed down, they, re, they feel it the worst. They really do. And the, the, the folks in some of these secure areas that, you, that we think are the ones that uh, are the lost souls, they're not the lost souls. Because if they're approached properly, uh, we have an area, a courtyard down there, where there's, uh, uh, we have a great horticulturist. And they have uh, all the flowers and plants set up there. And uh, guess who does all the weeding? 
and they're gardening there. So they do. And they, they found out what they did before, and she brings a, a trowel with her. Okay, who do I have to help me today with, with, the, with the planting? With the trowel. I remember doing that. Up they get. She, she had these two, these two guys on either side of her. One guy was an ex-boxer, about 6'3", and, another, and she's got arms around these two guys, taking them out to work in the garden. Anything's possible. It really is. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.